Oh, there's nothing else I can say other than I'm hooked on a bad habit, although I guess there are plenty of worse habits to have. Another Technix vintage stereo receiver followed me home. This is a Technix SA310, which is a bigger brother to the SA210 that I already collected, and it has some interesting features. The first interesting feature is the designation printed on the front that says New Class A. What is that? And the second interesting feature is the computer drive monitor that's printed on the front. That suggests there's definitely something more going on here than meets the eye with this particular receiver. But again, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now to help explain some of the things I'm going to say when I talk about this particular stereo receiver, I need to talk a little bit about audio amplification. Audio amplifiers exist in several different classes, or ways that the circuit operates. The first class, known as Class A, is typically a very high fidelity method because there is no switching distortion between a push-pull outputs pair of transistors or vacuum tubes, I suppose. I don't know about vacuum tubes as much as I do transistors, but I suspect that between two mismatched vacuum tubes there could be some switching distortion. A Class A amplifier is extremely high fidelity because of this. It doesn't produce any clipping distortion in the signal as it's amplifying. But the problem with a Class A amplifier is that it's extremely inefficient. At most, it can be about 50% efficient, and for every watt that goes out of the amplifier and into the speakers, there'll be at least another watt generated as heat. So pretty soon, if you get to building a Class A amplifier of any appreciable power, it gets to making a lot of heat very quickly. The solution to this, and what's used in most home stereo receivers, most stereo receivers that you can buy, is known as a Class AB amplifier. A Class AB amplifier typically starts out in Class A operation and stays that way up to a couple of watts worth of output power for maximum fidelity at low volumes. But then it switches to Class B mode. A Class B amplifier is called a switching amplifier because a Class B amplifier splits the amplification of the audio waveform, which would be represented by 360 degrees, it splits it in half. Each transistor in the push-pull output amplifies half of the signal. Well, the thing that can happen with a Class A-B amplifier when it's running in the switching mode, if the transistors, if one of the transistors is shut off when the signal is heading for it, when it's heading to amplify the part of the signal that, so to speak, belongs to it, there can be switching distortion as that transistor turns on, as a, as, as a voltage bias is applied to it, and the transistor comes on, there can be switching distortion, which sounds like notching in the audio, as the transistor comes on. Well, what, what computer drive and new class A attempt to do is they attempt to deal with that distortion. So what Technix did in the design of their receiver, they implemented a circuit that they refer to alternatively as synchro bias, or new class A computer drive. Well, computer drive is this little chip right here, and yes, it really says that on it, which is cool. At least every, every stereo receiver ought to have at least one chip in it that says computer drive. I'm pretty convinced, because that's such a cool thing to say. But it really does have a purpose. It's described, and I think somewhat, um, I think you'd have to be playing fast and loose with words to accurately consider this thing a computer. It seems to me it's more of a logic circuit that deals with some variable inputs and takes an action or a set of actions based on what it's seeing. Computer drive applies a constant biasing signal to both the NPN and PNP transistors in the amplifier module that you saw just moments ago. So both transistors are always switched on to some degree, which should, at least per the theory in the service manual for this receiver, which I had to look at and comprehend to make sure that I was explaining it correctly, but which should, at least in theory, eliminate or greatly reduce any effects that switching distortion as one transistor comes on to amplify its part of the audio signal has. Well, Computer Drive does this by looking at a couple of different inputs. It looks at the incoming audio level. It also looks at the thermal conditions. 
and then it makes decisions as to how much bias it should be applying to the amplifier to keep the transistors at least minimally turned on so that neither one of them has to switch on during an audio amplification process. The new Class A process is in reality just a Class AB amplifier, but the bias is being applied to the transistors constantly to keep them from being shut off in the course of normal operation. And of course, probably just because it helps sell more amplifiers and gives the end user more pretty blinking lights to look at, there is an item on the front panel known as the computer drive monitor, which purports to tell you what the computer drive is currently doing with the input that it sees. The computer drive also has another function. That special function that computer drive performs happens when the receiver is first turned on and is indicated on the computer drive monitor display. What it does is it performs a so-called preheating operation on the amplifier's final transistors. According to the service manual for this receiver, Technics makes the claim that preheating the transistors leads to more consistent performance. And while it's probably true, it's unlikely to be something that the average person is going to notice. Preheating is accomplished by driving a high bias current level through the transistors while they would normally be idling, thusly causing them to warm up quite a bit as compared to normal operation when the amplifier would be idle. So for 15 seconds at startup, as the computer drive system checks itself out, which is indicated by those rolling lights over to the right, it's also applying that high level of bias current to the power amplifier transistors. When it, has done, when it is done doing that, it switches over to the auto bias mode, which you just saw it do. And that is when computer drive is actually watching the temperature of the amplifier and the intensity of the input signal to see what it ought to be doing with regards to bias on the amplifier's final transistors to keep them partially turned on at all times. The signal lights over here indicate whether a signal is low or high. And really, I found that I had to turn it up pretty honking loud to get it to the point where the low LED went off to indicate that the low signal threshold had been released. I had to turn it up even higher to get the high signal LED to go out to indicate that the high signal point had been reached. The third LED over here is a thermal monitor. Now what you and I would think of as a thermal monitor today is a circuit that constantly knows the temperature and takes action accordingly. Well, this is much simpler than that. This is a simple thermal sensing bulb that is attached to the heat sink of the power amplifier and all in the world that it does is it waits for the temperature to reach 60 degrees Celsius or I believe 140 degrees Fahrenheit before it trips this LED. Now I'm not sure what the point of this is because it does not shut down at that point, although I would consider that a point when things were starting to get more than a little bit hot, especially given that this is a hybrid amplifier based receiver and the hybrids seem to be just a little bit delicate. Anyway, I collected this receiver because I wanted to have an example of a unit that featured the computer drive technology, but this thing also has some other cool tricks. And I saw its bigger brother, an SA410, at that vintage record equipment and stereo equipment sale that I go to, but that one was heavily damaged. Someone had p punched in all the front panel buttons to where they'd broken off, which I'm told is a common problem because they're somewhat weak plastic. And there was massive internal burn damage, and so although I tried to salvage it, I was unable to do so. But this thing has some cool features. It sounds good. It sounds about as good as any other decent quality stereo amplifier. I haven't noticed a huge difference. But while it has a digital tuner readout, it also has an analog scale over here that is actually part of a needle style meter movement and a digital to analog converter and a buffer circuit that comes off of the tuning microcontroller actually generates a voltage off of a tap on the transformer in the unit that drives the needle from one end of the dial to the other in agreement with what the digital tuner says. This is of course totally unnecessary but it's seriously cool and I hope you can see the meter, ne the meter needle as it moves back and forth. I've got no antenna attached to it right now, so it can't ever complete the scan tuning operation. But as you can see, I can stop it. I can run it back down again. Or I can hit the preset buttons, at which point it will go to what the presets indicate, which is pointless, but extremely cool.
This unit was, of course, an eBay find, and it's in pretty good condition. The front panel buttons are in nice shape. Only the memory button has the, on has the only sign of a boo-boo on it. And while the bottom panel and some of the interior metal is a little bit rusty, this thing does show signs that it's been taken pretty good care of. For example, the battery compartment, although it came to me with some old carbon zinc batteries installed, they are still holding a charge and keeping the memory going. And there's absolutely no corrosion whatsoever in the battery compartment. The only interesting thing is that at some point, somebody put a replacement power cord on the unit. I don't know if something unfortunate happened to the original, but whoever did the work did a good job. So I guess that's okay. But let's hear about how it sounds. Unlike the majority of receivers that I'm familiar with, especially models in this Technics lineup from the 1980s, this one does support a set of remote speakers, and even more interestingly, it wires them in parallel when you turn the remote switch on, whereas most of the receivers I'm familiar with wire the speakers in series. Now I'm playing this receiver for the sake of this demonstration into a cheap uh, pair of Jensen JHT805 speakers. I gather these are part of a 5.1 channel home theater system made during the time that the Ricoton company controlled the Jensen name as opposed to International Jensen loudspeakers themselves. And so I suppose they're not the highest quality speakers that you could come up with. They don't have any meaningful specifications on the back of them, but I put my ohmmeter across one of them and came up with about 12 ohms worth of resistance. And I'd say that probably being a little bit generous here, that's probably right around a 4-inch driver. And they did at least take some effort to make sure it was a two-way driver because they have a little whizzer cone in here for the highs, which is better than nothing. But they really don't sound that bad, especially for the $10 or so that I paid at the thrift store. I have the grill off of here so you can kind of see what's going on. And just to try and make sure that all the record labels are equally annoyed with me, tonight I have a capital EMI release featuring Bob Seeger, who is a very good singer. Anyway, here's what the receiver sounds like playing through these cheap little Jensen speakers. What you'll hear is limited by my camera's microphone, but it sounds pretty good. Anyway, there you have the demonstration of what these little speakers sound like when they're being driven by this Technics SA310 Quartz Synthesizer FMAM Stereo Receiver. It wouldn't be a bad little setup for a small shelf system or something like that. However, one thing did become obvious in my playing with these speakers. It was quite obvious that this thing's little 35 watts per channel output, which is decent, but you know, not enough to get the police summoned or shake the block down or anything like that. It was quite obvious that these little Jensen speakers were being pushed well beyond their limits when this thing's volume control was just a 3 out of the maximum of 10. In a crime against music lovers everywhere, I played my mother's uh, Backstreet Boys CD, which has plenty of boom and thump music on it, and these little speakers did not like it in the slightest. But the receiver was just as happy as a clam to drive them that hard.